Let's start with a little history lesson. Most are familiar with the use of the Mosaic Tabernacle described in detail in Exodus 35 through 40 as part of Moses' 40 years wandering in the wilderness. Not all recognize the tabernacle's presence through Joshua, all of the judges, and then the kings Saul, David, and Solomon. Collectively, the Mosaic Tabernacle served over 400 years, most of the time at Shiloh. It preceded Solomon's temple, completed approximately 970 BC, where our archaeological records become a bit better and more plentiful. However, its full magnific magnificence <laughs> was short-lived, uh, having been plundered within five years of Solomon's death when Shishak, king of Egypt, plundered Jerusalem. It arguably serves in less secular grandeur to other kings and is ultimately destroyed by the Babylonians in 586 BC during the reign of Zedekiah. Cross-reference early chapters and prophetic warnings of the Book of, War Book of Mormon. The Ark of the Covenant and the Mercy Seat make no further appearance in biblical text. When Babylon is conquered by Persia in fulfillment of prophecy, King Cyrus initiates the return of the Jews and the rebuilding of Jerusalem. Zerubbabel's temple, or Ezra's temple, as is built uh, by commission of Persian King Darius to Jewish governor Zerubbabel in Jerusalem. While completed in approximately 516 BC, it isn't until 60 years later when the priest Ezra is sent to beautify the temple, teach Judah the law of God, and restore temple service. Synagogue worship is believed to arose during captivity. These are not temples, but small religious buildings in scattered Jewish communities. Jerusalem changes hands to the Greeks in 331 BC. The temple is defiled by Antiochus Epiphanes in 168 BC, just prior to the Jewish independence via the Maccabean Revolt. The Romans conquer Palestine in 63 BC. Herod the Great is made king of Judea in 37 BC. He rebuilds the temple with great splendor to appease the Jews. Herod's temple, as it comes to be commonly called, is the temple during the life of Jesus of Nazareth. All right, this is the east facing side of the tabernacle. It was always oriented to the four points of the compass, this side being facing east. It's the only entrance to the proper of the tabernacle itself. Gateways were always considered an area of judgment. So if there was ever an issue amongst the 12 tribes, they were brought here as the elders of representing the tribe amongst the priest to do a actual review and, and find out what was going on. When a sacrifice was performed, family would come to this point they would bless the animal that was being turned over to the priest. The father would lay his hands on the animal's head and they'd do a blessing transferring the issues, the blessings or the, the, the sins to the animal and the animal was turned over to the priest. The father would go in with the priest to perform the actual sacrifice. You'll notice that each one of the stations we have some youth posted here and they're all prepared to give a presentation which if we have time we'll come back and get them to do it for us but for the time being we're just going to zip through here this is the altar of sacrifice now in the times of Moses this would have had a fire in it constantly and this is where the sacrifices were actually offered um, most people believe that the sacrifices were burned in their entirety actually there were only two sacrifices that were done all the rest of them were more like uh, dare I say it, a barbecue in which a piece of the animal was burned in its entirety. The rest of it was actually cooked. A portion stipulated in the book of Leviticus was to be given to the priests. That would be for their support. And that would actually feed them and their families. The rest of the family would partake of a meal from the sacrificed animal. And this would be very similar to our Thanksgiving type thing where we group together and we have a communal meal. That would be the original communal meals they were performed here. The other interesting thing about the altar of sacrifice, you notice there's four horns on it, okay? The horns symbolically represent an animal's strength, power, able to protect its herd and whatnot. In ancient times, and this is where the concept of sanctuary came from, if an individual was accused of a crime, and he felt he was being unjustly accused. He could come into this area and it would grasp hold with both hands of the altar horns and would have to hold on to them until he would get a hearing with a priest. Okay, 
the thing is about that would have been hot. <laughs> so it's it's just kind of an interesting thing. But that is where the concept of sanctuary comes from. Uh, this is the labor of water that was used for ritual washing before the priests would perform their duties inside the tabernacle, which is located behind me. You'll notice the, the horn underneath, which is actually an animal's horn, would have been filled with oil and used for consecration. There's a very famous painting, and I think it's hanging in the hall when we'll go over there, where Moses is depicted as ordaining Aaron to the office of priest and acting high priest in the Aaronic priesthood to perform the duties here in the tabernacle. That would have actually taken place right behind the labor of water before the, the, the gates and he would have been anointed with oil. This is the entrance to the actual tabernacle itself. And the room on the other side of it would have been the holy place. And the room behind that would have been the holy of holies. You'll notice there's four columns with three openings in it that specifically spelled out the construction, how it's built, how it's operated, and how it was maintained, moved, and set back up all through the scriptures in, in the Torah. That would be Exodus and Leviticus uh, specifically. Notice the, the, the four columns make three openings. When Solomon built his temple, these curtains that hung in the openings each had an angel on it. And it has a counterpart in the book of Revelation and several other places, Ezekiel's book and whatnot. They're all symbolically representative of things about returning to the presence of the Lord. Now, the interesting thing about the tabernacle, its orientation, its use, it has a tie to the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve were cast out of the garden Eden. They left going eastward, out of the presence of the Lord, into the world. The tabernacle is specifically built and oriented so that when you come back to it, you're coming from the east, back through the steps you need to perform, the cleansing through the sacrifice, the cleansing through the water, and the entrance back into the presence of the Lord, moving from the east back towards the west reversing the action that Adam and Eve took. That's why in the temple you get a lot of reference of your Adam and Eve reenacting re, re the, the whole uh, scene. Okay, we are in the holy place, which is the first chamber of the tabernacle. It's about twice the size of the holy of holies, which is behind us. Um, if Carl can pan upwards and get the ceiling, you get a feel for the multicolored materials that were used in the ceiling. If you read through the book of Exodus and Leviticus, they're exacting uh, instructions on how to build this structure and how to put it together. There are layer upon layer upon layer of different colored, quote, uh, tent coverings over the top. Then the last layer is made out of badger skin. This ugly, dark, <laughs> un unattractive piece of material on the outside. And I always thought that was an interesting thing, but the multi-colors that they name in those layers remind me of the rainbow. you notice we're arched over the top of the rainbow, which was a symbol of the covenant of the Lord. The dark covering on the outside is reminiscent of the description that uh, is in Psalms and in Proverbs about the Lord not being uh, appealing or uh, having worldly appeal to mankind, which is kind of interesting. It parallels all through this structure. Okay. Throughout the uh, tabernacle representation model here, we have volunteers that, that actually do presentations at each of the stations. So we're going to capture these two young ladies. You're on. Hi, welcome to the temple covering section. I'm Maggie, I'm from Southern Virginia, and I'm 21 years old. And I'm Rachel, I'm from West Valley, Utah, and I'm also 21 years old. And as you can see here, there are four layers to the covering that was on top of the tabernacle. The first layer is made of badger skin, as recorded in Exodus, but some think that it may have actually been from a type of water animal, and it provided protection from the weather. The second type of covering is the red ram skin here dyed. This 
Ramskin is based after the model of Abraham and Isaac because a ram ran through and Abraham was about to sacrifice his son. So we use that skin covering today and it's dyed blood. It's dyed red based on the blood of Jesus Christ. The third layer was made of goat skin and goat skin was often used by the Bedouin people to keep them warm and protected. And a goat was also the only animal sacrificed in representation of Jesus Christ on the Day of Atonement in the days of Exodus and the Old Testament. And so that is what the third layer represents. And the innermost layer here represents fine linens that you may have just seen in the Holy Place of Holies of Holies. The Holy Place or Holies of Holies. It was dyed the symbolic colors of blue, scarlet, and purple and included cherubim. And each of these four layers testify and represent Jesus Christ. And I know that each of them can represent how he can cover each of us from the sins and temptations and sorrows of this world. And just as Brother Brad R. Wilcox said in the devotional, that the grace of Jesus Christ truly is sufficient to cover us, to transform us, and to help us as long as that transformation takes. Thank you. If you look at the colors again, they're reminiscent of the colors of a rainbow. So when you're standing inside the holy place in the Holy of Holies, you're covered with a rainbow, which is symbol of the, the covenant that the Lord made with us, uh, with specifically Noah and Enoch, <laughs> after the, uh, or before the flood actually took place. So it's reminiscent of the covering of the Lord. Again, the Hebrew word for cover is the same word we use for atonement. On our right is the table of showbread. So there are 12 loaves of bread that have been made without yeast and mixed with frankincense. The, that's the incense that's burned throughout the rituals inside this structure. And tradition holds that there was a labor of uh, wine there as well. So there's your bread and wine. This is reminiscent of our sacrament today. In the center of the room is the altar of incense. That uh, frankincense would be burned on this altar at pretty much all times. And then to the left of the room is the candelabra. Now, the interesting thing about the altar of incense is there's a chamber underneath inside. And tradition holds that the actual uh, garment that uh, Elijah wore and then it fell to Elijah, <laughs> that that same cloak was rolled up and kept inside that particular box. Okay? And then when Zechariah received instruction from the angel, he was told to take it out and give it to his son, who was John the Baptist. Okay, directly behind the altar of incense, you'll notice they're burning some incense. Interesting. Um, there is a set of curtains over the doorway. Uh, they're referred to as the veil. This is the same veil that was uh, torn open when uh, Christ died in Herod's temple uh, in Jerusalem. The uh, curtains were embroidered with cherubim reminiscent of the guardians who protected the Holy of Holies and the Garden of Eden when Adam and Adam and Eve were expelled from the presence of the Lord. So again, migrating backwards, coming from the east to the west, we are returning back to the presence of the Lord. The interesting thing about this particular spot is there was a special incense oil that was created and its instructions are in the, in the Torah that was spread on the floor between those two spaces. So this room would have had just the most marvelous smell in it from that distinct odor from the, the incense that was put on the floor and the frankincense that were burned on the altar itself. So you would get near the temple and you would get that one of a kind odor and it was like, yep, there's the temple. Okay. We are standing in the Holy of Holies. This is the place where the acting high priest, wearing the garments of the high priest, would enter through this curtain right here, holding the laver of the, the blood that was captured from the Paschal Lamb. Only once a year on Yom Kippur, that was the Day of Atonement, that's the only time this room would be entered other than the prophet himself coming in to speak with the Lord. The Ark of the Covenant, a lot of times in this is misunderstood. The Ark of the Covenant itself is the box on the bottom part. That's the Ark. The lid itself is a different piece altogether and is referred to as the mercy seat. And it's often commonly accepted that the Lord actually sat between the two angels on 
the lid of the box. The covering, the name, the Hebrew name for the, the covering of the, the lid is the same word that's used for atonement. Uh, we're standing on the west side of the tabernacle now. <laughs> and in the real one, there wouldn't have been an opening for the back door type thing. There's only one entrance, uh, symbolic of there's only one way back into the presence of the Lord, and that's through the Lord Jesus Christ. The structure itself is built such that it is symbolic and representative of uh, so many different things. I mean, even down to the fact that the cords that, that tie the posts, the posts in the socket, and they're gold and brass and bronze, and the stakes that hold up the, and it's all symbolic of the structure of the church and how it's built. That painting that I mentioned about Moses ordaining Aaron shows Aaronic priesthood, uh, not Levites, but the Aaronic priesthood members would have been the equivalent of our deacons and teachers shoulder to shoulder around the perimeter of the inside of this structure. They were there specifically to protect, guard, and make sure only the proper people were in the proper place in the house of the Lord. This is a great uh, depiction because it shows a patriarch of family bringing the sacrificial animal to the priest, and all the priests were, would have been attired in white. The acting high priest is wearing the attire that was specified in the scriptures here. This is the eastern gate. The altar sacrifice, the water laver, and then the gates going inside to the holy place and then the holy of holies. Notice the congregation that's gathered on the outside. The only ones that were allowed to enter were the, the patriarchs representing each of the families as they would do their sacrifice and turn them over to the priests inside who were offering the sacrifices. And then the acting high priest, and we'll go over his tire in a minute, would have been in charge of all the ordinances taking place inside the tabernacle. The menorah inside the tabernacle is highly significant. You'll notice there are seven branches to it. Um, that was spelled out again in the scriptures, and it was all made out of one piece of gold beaten and formed into this shape, okay? They were commanded that they were to burn oil in the lamp stand continuously. When the temple was built by Solomon, um, and then later by Ezra, uh, again, their commandment was to have this in place, burning the oil at all times. It was the only light source inside the holy place. It's symbolic of the light given off by the, the Son of God. It is also significant in that if you have Jewish friends and they, they celebrate Hanukkah, when the Jews rebelled against the Greeks, led by a man called Macca, uh, Judas Maccabee, when they actually won and pushed the Greeks out of the temple, they went through the process of cleansing the temple again and relighting the lamp. They could only come up with the sacred oil enough to burn the lamp one day. The process takes eight days to create new oil. So they said, well, we'll light the lamp and if it goes out, it goes out. And uh, the miracle was that the oil that would have been sufficient normally for one day burned for the eight days. And that's the Feast of Lights, or excuse me, the Feast of Hanukkah that the Jews still celebrate today. All right. We're going to go over the Ark of Covenant once more time. The, again, the box itself was called the Ark. The lid itself was called the Mercy Seat. Inside the Ark of the Covenant were three objects. There was the tablets that Moses took down from the Mount Sinai, the second set, because he destroyed the first set. There was also a pot of manna, and there was the rod of Aaron, which had budded an almond rod, which had budded and actually bore fruit on it, and that were inside the box to symbolize all of the things that the Lord had done for them on their behalf. Um, the symbolism here is incredible. We covered that a bit before, that the covering our actual mercy seat, the covering itself, the, the Hebrew word actually used to call that lid or the, that covering is the same word we use for atonement because he covers our sins. Earlier in the tabernacle I mentioned a famous painting that where Moses is depicting setting part where Aaron is the acting high priest. Now the, it was not the office of a high priest in the Melchizedek priest, but it was the acting officer, senior officer, of the Aaronic priesthood. He had to be 
a bloodline of Aaron himself to be a priest if you were a direct line <clears throat> bloodline of any of his relatives later on uh, you could be uh, operating in the Aaronic priesthood but at the level of a deacon or a teacher notice that his attire is specifically spelled out in the scriptures okay and we'll cover that in a minute when we get next to this other piece you will also notice the brethren standing in the back are arrayed in white. These are the guards that we talked about that stood around the perimeter of the structure itself to protect it. This is a depiction of the tabernacle as it was in use while they were traveling in the wilderness. Notice at night there would be a pillar of fire over the tabernacle itself, centering over the Holy of Holies. During the day, the pillar of fire would have been replaced by a cloud of smoke that acted as a covering. Now, the interesting thing about that is twofold. <clears throat> the covering, again, the Hebrew word for the atonement, cover, uh, would cover the camp and cast a shadow over it so they weren't in that burning heat. At night, it was their source of light. So, the significance here is that, well, think of it this way. If you drive somebody's, past somebody's home and there's a light on, you would say, well, they're home. Or if you saw smoke coming out of their chimney, you'd say, yeah, they're home. So whenever the the flame was there or the cloud was there, you could be guaranteed that the Lord was there. This is a picture of the current day uh, Temple Square in Jerusalem. Now, the two temples that were there, the original one was built by Solomon, uh, which was destroyed by the Babylonians. The second temple was built during Ezra's time, uh, is referred to as the second temple or Ezra's temple. It's misnamed Herod's temple because he came back as a builder and did some extensive renovation. Um, when it was destroyed by Titus and the Romans in 72 AD, they tore down the entire structure. Um, <laughs> the incident happened was Vespasian had left instructions. He was the emperor to his son Titus, who was the general in the field, not to destroy the temple. There was a miscommunication and a centurion threw a torch into the temple and it burned melting all of the gold inside of it. Since the temple had been basically destroyed, Titus said, tear it apart brick by brick and recover every ounce of gold that you possibly can. So it fulfilled the Lord's prophecy about not one stone being left standing upon another. Now, the only thing that is left of the site that is the original is this wall right here. This is the west facing wall of the temple base structure. Today we call it the Wailing Wall. And you'll notice on the left-hand side of the flag, there are people gathering. Those are the brethren. There is a wall that separates the side where the women can go and pray. If you go to the wall itself, all the little chinks are filled with tiny little pieces of paper that people have written prayers on and stuffed them into the wall. Okay, this is the acting high priest attire. Again, when we say high priest, this is not an office of Melchizedek priesthood. He is the senior officiating officer in the priest of the Aaronic priesthood. You will notice on his two shoulders are two onyx stones. Each one of them is engraved with six of the names of the tribes of Israel. And then a gold chain hung down to hold the ephod, which had 12 stones representing each of the tribes of Israel. Inside the ephod, which was an envelope, they would keep the Urim and Thummim. Uh, it was also referred to as the breastplate of judgment. If there was trouble within the camp of Zion, they couldn't decipher who it was. The senior patriarch of each of the tribes would array himself before the high priest. And it was tradition that the stone of the tribe that had the problem would glow because of the uh, uh, presence of the, the Urim and Thummim in the back. Over his head, you'll notice there's a gold plate. The engraving in Hebrew is holiness to the Lord, which you're highly familiar with. You can see that down at the bottom of the hem of the garment, which is highly significant in Hebrew uh, tradition, that is trimmed with belts and with pomegranates. They're down here at the bottom, if you can see them. The bells, the sound that the bells would ring are significant of the presence of the Lord in the pomegranates. Tradition holds that there are 614 seeds which represent every law that the Lord gave to them in the Torah. 
We refer to this as the covenant wall. There's four covenants depicted here. The one that was made with Noah, technically with Enoch. The one with Abraham, one with Moses, and the one with David. Now each of the covenants are renewed. You'll notice as you read through your Old Testament this year, that the Lord would make with covenant with the existing prophet at the time. The Abrahamic covenant is the one that we, we capitalize on the most. We have most information about that particular one. And then as each of these new prophets would come along, like Isaac, the covenant was renewed with each one of them. Same covenant, but it was just given to them all over again as if it never existed before. So it was new to them. Same thing takes place in the temple. It's given to you just as if it was never been given before. It's all yours. It's new to you. Now, the interesting thing about the Noah's covenant is if you read the book of, in the Pearl of Great Price, in the book of Moses, there is contained within it several chapters we refer to as the book of Enoch. And it talks out specifically that the Lord made the covenant with Enoch about the rainbow before he ever made it with Noah himself. So it's more of the covenant of Enoch than it is Noah. And you read that one very careful. It's a beautiful, beautiful blessing that the Lord gives Enoch. Did you put this whole thing together? Oh, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Nauvoo Temple. Of course, when you were there, I'll try and tweak your memory uh, about some of the things. The pylons that were built into the side of the building, these columns were topped with a sunstone and the base of it had a moonstone. And they're all around the, the temple itself. You'll notice that the temple, the, the sunstone that's on the outside of the temple has a full exposure of the sun himself. And then there's two hands holding cornucopia on either side, talking about the blessings that the Lord pour, pour out through the, me, the, the mechanism of the temple itself. If you go inside the temple, and sitting inside the celestial room, there is a different carving of the sunstone inside, where the sunstone isn't actually out completely from behind the clouds. It's still covered up, depicting that there's, it's a dawning of a new era, and the information is just beginning to come forth for the saints. Okay, here's a depiction of the baptismal font that you're highly familiar with. The labor of water that was used for ritual washing and anointing inside the tabernacle that Moses carried was very simple for, for purposes of utility, that they wouldn't be able to carry this one very easily. When Solomon built his temple, he expanded it extensively, and it became uh, more symbolic. We now use this same structure in our basements of our temples for the baptisms of the dead. Now you'll notice that there are 12 oxen on the, on the base that the laborer sits upon and rests upon their backs. The oxen is the symbol of the tribe of Ephraim. The oxen is also a symbol of an animal or a burden, a beast of burden. They carry a heavy load and what's being symbolically represented here is not each one of the 12 tribes, but 12 representations of Ephraim bearing the weight of the responsibility of carrying the blessings of the temple to each of the 12 tribes is here. If you turn to Doctrine and Covenants, I can turn to Doctrine and Covenants. There's a wonderful section in 133 in which the Lord talks about the return of the 12 tribes and this is they who are in the north country shall come remembrance of the Lord. He goes down, and they shall bring forth their rich treasures into the children of Ephraim, my servants, in the boundaries of the everlasting hills. They shall there they fall down and be crowned with glory, even in Zion, by the hands of the servants of the Lord, even the children of Ephraim. So the tribe of Ephraim's responsibilities bear the blessings of the temple to the world. To quote President Nelson, anytime you do anything that helps anyone on either side of the veil take a step toward making covenants with God and receiving their essential baptismal and temple ordinances, you are helping to gather Israel. It's just that simple. <laughs>